Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is um, going to be a conversation and sort of an introduction to our newly developed pre-K self assessment tool and continuous quality improvement tool. Um, so we're going to take some time today to sort of walk through that and share how it came to be and how it should be used um, and just introduce it to folks. So we're really excited to be doing that. Um, I think many of you know me. My name is Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist on our early learning team at DOE. I'm going to let Marcy introduce herself and then Sue. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Marcy Whitcomb. I think I know a couple of you um, met in person. I'm the pre -K, public pre-K consultant for the early learning team for the DOE. And I'll throw it to Sue. Yep. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. I hope you had a restful vacation last week. I am Sue Gallant. I am the pre-K expansion consultant for the early learning team at the Department of Ed. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you again soon in person. So we will have time at the end for uh, any questions or discussion points. So I think our goal today is really for Marcy and Sue and I to sort of go through the tool itself and then offer time for discussion uh, towards the end. Um, so certainly if you have anything that comes up, jot it down or throw it in the chat room and um, we'll have it to address at, at a later point. So uh, before I share my screen, we don't have slides to share. We're actually going to share the tool itself and sort of go through it that way. So before I share that for everybody to see, um, I did want to give a brief sort of how this came to be, why this tool exists. Um, so as we know, public pre-K has been expanding and programs have been starting at a really fast pace over the last, gosh, seven years, really, maybe more, um, certainly in the last two um, and, and moving forward. So it's really exciting. Um, our team has the capacity to provide technical assistance before, during, and after the planning process for these programs. Um, but we were really hoping to give schools something that they could use themselves to self-assess their own programs. Um, our team is happy to assist with that, and we'll talk more about that when the time comes today, but really just giving programs sort of the independence to look at what they offer or in the planning process to think about what they want to offer um, and show where there may be room for growth um, and also to celebrate what they've done thus far, because um, certainly there's going to be points to of that along the way too. So we did do a little bit of research and we reached out to some other states that have similar tools like this for their public pre-K programs um, and had lots of conversations, lots of drafts and just sort of went from there. So um, it is very applicable to Maine and to programs that exist in our state. However, it was derived from a collaboration of other states tools and sort of what we liked and what we didn't like and what we thought would work well for, for Maine. Um, so that's sort of how this tool came to be. Um, and now we're just getting ready to, to put it out there. And certainly there, there could be some slight changes along the way. Um, it's not so much a draft anymore, but as programs start to access it and start to use it, I imagine we may have some feedback come in. Um, we have test run it with a public program already and received some really helpful feedback from them and, and were, was able to implement that into the draft. So we're excited though um, to get more. So certainly it, it could have some changes in the future that might be slight. So just wanted to give folks a heads up in that. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Marcy and I'm gonna share my screen and she will help us better understand the tool. Thanks, Nicole. Sure. <laughs> so as Nicole talked about, this is a tool for self-assessment. Um, is it possible to make that a little bit bigger? Yes. Perfect. And if it's if you guys um, joining us are having a hard time reading it, just throw in the chat. We can make it a little bit bigger too, I think. Um, so this is the public pre-K self-assessment and continuous quality improvement tool. And this is um, this is the actual tool. As Nicole said, we didn't we didn't um, do a PowerPoint. We didn't cut and paste. We just we're going to share the most of the entire tool with you. Not all of it, but most of it just to get a general feel. So this evaluation tool, self-evaluation tool is really just there to assist our public pre-K programs in knowing um, where they fall in meeting chapter 124 requirements and then also looking at just high quality recommendations for pre-K programming that we know are best practice that are research-based, that sort of thing. So 
Um, what I will say is this is a self-assessment tool. This is not something that is required by our office or our early learning team. We will not ask to see it. We will not ask if it's completed. It's a tool that's really based off the strengths of your program and then considerations and recommendations and just to get an idea of sort of what next steps may be, where you want, where you're headed with your program and just sort of to guide you around that. That being said, we, the three of us and, and others on our team are always available if you have questions or need support or resources or guidance around anything that you see here or any questions as you go forward looking at your own program. So really we're just looking at your capturing your strengths, you're looking for opportunities and building that out and this is a document to help you. Um, so again, this is an intern, this is a way to internally reflect and assess your current practices. It's a method to identify um, areas of strength and opportunity and then to inform continuous improvement. What this tool is not is an evaluation to score, grade, or label a program. It's not used to publicly compare pre-K programs or judge them. Um, again, it's it's very much a self-assessment. We're not like we're not going to ask for it. We're not going to ask to see. Let's see how this program is doing as compared to this one. That's not what it's for. Um, and it's not a staff evaluation tool. And it's also not a means of comparing individual pre-K programs within a school district. So we're not looking at comparing different classrooms or different schools within one district. It really is for the over the general arching of the overall public pre-K program in that district or in that school. So who it is for is um, an internal team who may collaborate to review and reflect on programming. Um, it's for schools operating within a formal community partnership, consulting with individuals from all agencies, and then also individuals reflecting on program co components. So you'll need to decide um, who is best to figure to fill it out and work on the pieces, uh, maybe put a team together. Um, if you do have outlying partnerships without, you know, um, private programs in the community, you'll want to work with them um, just to make sure that everything is, you know, just so you're getting an idea of your self-assessment and your um, parts of all your programming. So instructions, we'll get to looking at what the components and uh, elements are in the breakdown in just a moment. Um, but the instructions are pretty simple. You read the element and you, then you select which best describes in that row your pre-K programming. Um, some elements have more than one description and it's okay to make selections in more than one column. There's also an area for notes, which we'll see in a moment. Um, and then when all components are complete, you'll tally your results, which we will go over um, at the end. And then you'll have an area to sort of write your strengths and then what you wanna focus on as a program. Uh, definitions in the document, initial stages, which is the SAU and or school does not yet implement the quality component. In development means that the SAU and or school implements the quality component to some degree, but there may be room for growth. Um, in place is that the SAU or school implements the quality component as it's described in 124. So if you're looking at chapter 124 um, requirements, if they're in place, there in place. And so that would be that that would be where you put that. Um, and those are the basic approval standards for public preschool and pre-K and um, or as described by research based um, indicators of high quality programming. And we'll go through those in a moment. And then well established um, is where the SAUs or schools um, implementation of the quality components go beyond what is required in chapter 124. Then we have a notes page because notes pages are always handy. And finally, we are gonna go through a couple of the actual pages of components and elements, but this is sort of the breakdown. This is sort of what it looks like. So the components that we have, um, there are six in total, student recruitment and enrollment. And that just looks at enrollment protocol for eligible four-year-olds, looks at transitioning to kindergarten plans and transi transition teams on um, those things built out recruitment of students and assistance for enrollment documents for families and parents. Um, student instruction looks at alignment to state standards, concept and skill development, teacher and team planning and multilingual learners and how they're supported. It also looks at alignment to a K-3 instructional and assessment practices, developmentally appropriate practices, um, working and supporting children with special needs and support services and interventions. The next one, next component, student assessment and ongoing progress monitoring. Here we're gonna look at alignment to state standards, alignment for, for 
to K to three um, assessment practices within the school, assessment informing classroom instruction, intervention referrals, child find, um, and a few other things there. Staff development and certifications includes um, what your program does for staff evaluations. Um, it includes looking at certifications and qualifications for uh, teachers and ed tech staff in the classroom. And then professional development and mentoring and coaching programs that you're utilizing. Program environments and operational elements include your classroom environment, um, ratios, nutritional, looking at nutritional programming, outdoor school facilities, your class observations, um, program dosage, indoor school facilities, and then transportation. And then we look at family and community engagement, which includes community engagement, communication with um, community partners um, and or community learning partners. So not just programs that you may be partnering with for pre-K programming, but also community partners who may be a learning resource um, to come in and maybe do, or maybe like do a field trip or come in and do the, like a library, those sort of things. Um, also looking at progress reports for children and students, partner relationships, um, family engagement plans or protocols that might be in place, uh, parent-teacher conferences, and then support to parents and families, what that looks like, how that happens. Perfect. And then I'm going to throw it back to Nicole. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and dive into a component and an element. And I also wanted to take a moment and sort of show you how the scoring definitions, the scoring options are laid out. Um, Marcy mentioned that there's a column for well-established and a column for not applicable. But what I wanted to share, and as you'll see in a moment, is that those options aren't necessarily there for every element. Um, and I wanted to show you why. Um, and also, I realized as Marcy was talking that I failed to mention um, that this self-assessment tool would be a really great option for those districts that are operating this year or next year under the uh, main jobs and recovery funding, the RFA that we had put out for expansion. Part of that grant process asked applicants school districts to identify how they would evaluate their program that they're operating under that grant funding. So this would be uh, one way that you could do that. It could be the way that you do that. Um, totally up to you. So we wanted to make sure that I mentioned that, um, that this would be a viable option to evaluate your programs under that grant. Not the only one and not the must be one, uh, but certainly an option. Okay, so this first page, I'm gonna flip to page five. Um, the element that Marcy had just sort of described a moment ago is on the side left-hand column, student recruitment and enrollment. And then you'll see in the next column down are the elements. So sort of student recruitment enrollment is sort of like the chapter. And then these elements are, are the sub parts of that chapter, the sub parts of that component. Um, so as you look across, you'll see how, for example, recruitment of students, is laid out under each of the scoring options. So in its initial stages, recruitment of students, your district might have recruitment strategies or attempts within the community, but they've not yet been established. Above and beyond that, your district might have student recruitment efforts that reach some, but not all community members. Your district might have student recruitment that's completed through multiple and various forms of written communication within the community. And above and beyond that, your district might have or a staff member who's employed that is meant to assist in all recruitment efforts, including written and verbal strategies to reach all families that reside in the community and or also- I didn't get that. Sorry about that and or also translation services are provided when necessary. So you can see in this example, there is a well-established column because there are ways, and, and we've seen ways that schools in Maine go above and beyond what's expected of them in these elements. So we wanted to make sure that schools had an option to see where they are at and where possibly they could be doing more if it's necessary for, for their program. Um, I'm going to just scroll down real quick to page seven. And we're going to be into the next element, or excuse me, the next component, which is student instruction. 
you'll see here that the well-established column is empty because our team felt that there really wasn't a way for a school to go above and beyond what's expected regarding student instruction. And let me show you how. So one of the elements in student instruction is alignment to the state standards. So if you're in your, the initial stages of your pre-K program in accordance to this element, then your curriculum tool is used in the program that addresses some of the learning development standards, but not all. You might consider your program in development if an evidence-based curriculum tool is used in the program that addresses most of our learning development standards, but not all. You'd be in place if your program has an evidence-based curriculum tool that's used in the program that addresses all of the Maine's early learning and development standards. And it's really tricky to go above and beyond that because really that's the expectation that our state's early learning and development standards, all of the domains and content that fall under that document are embedded in your program's curriculum in, in terms of this element. So similar to concept and skill development, I'm gonna hop down here to the bottom row. You might be in the initial stages if the pre-K school day is divided up into separate content instruction periods. So we see this commonly in upper grades, right? A time period for math, a time period for literacy, a time period for this, as opposed to having it offered in an interdisciplinary way. Vice versa, you might be in development if instructional strategies that integrate all developmental domains are inconsistently used to support children's concept development in the pre-K classroom. So sometimes there's an opportunity for interdisciplinary learning, but other times learning is very siloed and specific to a specific content, perhaps. Whereas in place, your teachers are consistently using an integrated approach and use all developmental domains to support children's concept development in the pre-K classroom. So that's just sort of a quick example of a run through of some of those elements within student instruction to see why and hopefully understand why well established might not be an option everywhere. And then if we scroll down to page nine, pardon my scrolling, this is where you'll see another column added, which is not applicable because there are some programs throughout the state that would want to look at, so for this one, it's student instruction is the component. And if we're thinking about children with special needs, the first element, it's very possible that in your program or in your classroom, you don't have any students enrolled who have an identified special need. So therefore, the descriptors that fall in place under this rubric line wouldn't be applicable because we're not going to, um, or students in your classroom aren't going to access special education services if they don't need them. So therefore, it would be not applicable. Similarly, for students um, or learners who we identify as multilingual learners, you may not have any students in your program who are identified as multilingual learners. Therefore, this element line would not be applicable. So just be um, keep an eye out, be aware of where well-established is and why, and where not applicable is and why, so that when you're running this through your program and, and working with your teachers and administrators to complete this, you, you really understand you know, your program and why it may or may not fall into a specific descriptor. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it here for just a minute on the student instruction page. And I wanted to sort of run through what a conversation might look like in determining where we fall in terms of student instruction. So let's just make pretend for a moment um, that we're a team of educators and administrators discussing our current public pre-K program. And here we are, we find ourselves on page nine for the student instruction component. And we're gonna start with children with special needs. So let's take a moment, I'm gonna pause, I'll make this a little bit bigger. And think quietly to yourself about where your program might fall in terms of the descriptors for children with special needs. It's going to give us about 15 seconds or so.
Okay, team, we've had a few seconds to read over the descriptors for children with special needs. Given our program, we do have students currently enrolled who have an IEP in place. How do we feel our program meets the needs of these students in terms of the first row, access to special education services? What are your thoughts? I guess I have a question about that. Great. Because I'm not sure how I would score my program right now. Perfect. Um, because of the limitations of what CDS is able to provide. Right. So I would be more than happy to, I'm looking at well-established for us. And I think that mm -hmm. I would say that for my program, were it not for the fact that some of my students with special needs are receiving speech services and need to re receive through teletherapy. Yep. So not receiving services, you know, embedded within my classroom. Right. So is that a reflection on my program or how would I then score us? So great question, Pam. I, my guttural reaction to that is you're right, because in public pre-K, special education services are meant to be provided by CDS, right? Unless if there's a, a contract in place with the school that the school is providing it in lieu of CDS. But if you have an MOU with CDS and it says that CDS will provide special education services for your students, then we sort of need to think of it through that lens. So in your scenario, your students, or let's just say your student with teletherapy currently, which is not ideal, but is in place for the time being, mm -hmm. that, that student has access to special education services and qualified personnel in inclusive pre-K settings. Is that true right there? Is, he, is that student receiving that in your pre-K setting? Mm -hmm. or, is he, or is the child pulled out into a one-on-one -on -one session? They're pulled out. Okay, so then I would say, let's look down at the in-place. Access to special ed services and qualified personnel in inclusive pre-K settings. Mm, let's look down into in development. Access to special education services and qualified personnel in inclusive pre-K settings is available with some services provided in special ed settings. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like it may be more applicable. So my point being, and Sue and Marcy, hop in if you're thinking something differently. I would respond to this specific one in regards to the student. And if they're not receiving what their IEP is written for, then we sort of have to respond to it like for CDS. And later you'll see how that comes up for um, a strength room for improvement or a quality, uh, room for growth. And then where we could have, where that's going to spark the need for more work or spark the need for more conversation. Because in some cases that might light a spark in the public school to say, our children with special needs are not well established for us because our partnership or because CDS is not able to provide the service and we understand why, what can we be doing as a school district to make sure that those students are getting what they need and falling in well-established? But where can we be picking up slack if there's slack that needs to be picked up? Okay. So it's okay, like don't be afraid to, to score lower <laughs> or to feel, ugh about something right mm -hmm. I mean that's part of this process okay thank you I just I want to just point out one thing that you said very quickly but I think is really important in this um, element with children with special needs is what does the IEP say so if the IEP specifically states that this child will do better on a one-to-one -one setting not necessarily teletherapy because that's again not ideal but it is in a lot of places what we're limited to right now because of staffing um, but if the IEP says the child should be in a one-on-one -on -one setting to receive speech services, which could very well happen, then you're following the IEP, you're you're doing, you know, it's it's inclusive in that the follow the IEP is being followed correctly. Mm -hmm. So to me, that would be well established. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to just just consider what the IEP is saying too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So what, once this tool is available for folks, it'll be um, in a digital format that you can access digitally or print. So if you're accessing it digitally and we're going through here, and let's just say for argument's sake that our team decided that for this first line, we're gonna go with, it's 
accesses in development, then you can um, you know, do whatever you're comfortable doing. You might just choose a line and cross off that particular one to show that that's the one you chose. So Pam, I'm gonna put you on the spot real quick again. Does your program have a current MOU with your local CDS site, but it's not yet in place? Or do you have an MOU with CDS and it's in place? It's signed by both parties and active. Yes, we have one that's in place. Okay, so then we could, it's okay to choose that one there. So for this particular one, it doesn't look amazing visually, but we have two tallies. So let's go down to multilingual learners. And let's assume that we have one child in our program um, who is identified as a multilingual learner. We'll just give a second for folks to read the descriptors across that column. Any thoughts or experience with students in your program who are multilingual learners that you might identify this as, as far as the descriptor goes? So for conversation's sake, I'm going to say that, because um, you'll see where this comes up later, but instruction for, I'm starting here in, in, um, in development, uh, initial stages, instruction for multilingual learner students in the program is not yet supported by a certified ESOL teacher. So we have a, a new program, we have a young student, we've determined that this student speaks a second language, um, and we're in the process of identifying and working with our SAU's ESOL teacher. Our classroom staff rarely provides supports to multilingual learners within the context of the daily schedule. Mm. So even though we, we're not working with a certified ESOL teacher, I do think that our classroom staff has consultation opportunities or professional development opportunities where they are able to occasionally provide supports to multilingual learners. So I'm going to add a tally for this fake pre-K program here. And then the last element for this page anyways, is student support, or excuse me, support services and interventions. So this is looking at the district's MTSS, multi-tiered system of support model. And basically asking, is that model in place for pre-K students? So your interventions are not provided through an MTSS model. Interventions to address academic and behavioral development are provided, or that interventions to address all areas of development are provided. How do we think our program's doing? Well, we have a make pretend program. So let's pretend that interventions to address academic and behavioral developments are provided through an MTS model for pre-K students. So that's sort of just the process, right? When you're in the room or if you're doing this individually, you'll just think about each descriptor and each element in itself. We could run through one more. I'm gonna scroll for a moment down to page 12. I'm just gonna skip some of the other components and look at staff development and certification. Let me just make this a pinch smaller. So this is one of uh, an example of one of the components that has a well-established column. So thinking about yourself as, as educators in your classroom or the teachers that you have working in your classroom, where would you feel they fall in terms of certification and qualifications? I'll give you a second to look across that.
So Nicole, in order to exceed the minimum qualifications, is that would be like a, a national teacher or? Uh, it, it could be. We have teachers that have multiple early childhood um, certifications, like they might have a 282B for special education. They might also have, they might have a pre-K as well as um, chapter 115 has recently been updated. So uh, I believe it's the 029 goes up through third grade, pre-K to third grade, I want to say now. So there's some other op certification options that teachers can have, um, just depending on, on their individuals. They don't have to have more than that, but certainly they could. Certainly when I look at this, I think two of staff who meet the minimum education requirements, but others may exceed that. So a bachelor's degree is minimum for the 081, but there may be folks in your programs who have their master's in early childhood or in special education or a related field. Yeah. So Marcy, you're the pre-K teacher in my make pretend classroom. Where do you fall on this? Are you, as far as the top, um, first descriptors go? Uh, for me personally, mm -hmm. um, make I make pretend, but I'll go with what my certifications are. Okay. Um, if I'm the lead teacher. Yes, you are. I would be in initial stages because I do not currently hold a 081. Um, and I we're working on getting a waiver, but it's not in place yet. So we're working on that. Um, but I am aware and registered with Maine Roads Quality. Okay, so which one is that? In development or in place? It's in initial stages, right? Because I don't have an 081 or an 029. I have no certifications. That's okay, but the second, the second line, and actually I can make this so that it's more straight. Um, the second line is specifically speaking to your registry with Made Roads to Quality. So okay. regardless so, of your certification, are you registered with the PDF? Yes, we all, uh, myself and my ed tech both are. So we would be in, um, I can't see the in place because we are all registered. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and our evaluation of our teaching staff. Marcy, are you evaluated? Um, annually or by your administration? I am evaluated annually. Um, we do use SMART goals that are developed together. And um, there are multiple sources of data, including um, obs classroom observations, uh, different links. I don't know what the exact term is. Um, and uh, looking at my lesson plans weekly and monthly, uh, and looking at what I do for parent engagement and communication. So you're well established. Well established. Okay. So ultimately you would just go through the components and elements just like that and determine just sort of chunk by chunk where the program lies. If you have multiple classrooms, multiple teachers, and they're sort of falling all over the map in terms of their certifications or qualifications, then you could do one of two things. You could either just make a note of that in the side column to say, you know, majority of our staff um, fall into here or not so, or you might rate this one on one by teacher. Um, it's, it's sort of up to you and, and the size of your program and how you want to evaluate that. It's I, it, it's not for me or my team to say do this, not that, um, in terms of your rating, but rather a conversation to be had amongst your team to really determine where you fall and, and, and which descriptor best meets your current or desired program if you're just starting. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Sue real quick, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit to the end of the elements and components and let her describe the next piece. Sure. So while we want to be really clear that this is not about attaining a set score, it really is based on quality improvement. There is a, an area to tally your scores down at the bottom. And when we're talking about tallying these, you can make just a, a tally mark where your team was. There's a little bit of space that you can digitally enter some feedback um, in there. But for each section, there is an area to go through each of the components. So 
You can see that we looked at student instruction here. So there's a place where we can record where we were with children with special needs here. And this might be a place because some of these areas are what I call sticky and others are cut and dry. And certainly children with special needs is a sticky area. So you might make a note that, you know, this is due to issues with CDS not having adequate staffing or something here. There is a note section um, that can carry over and you can record that. But you can begin to see by where Nicole's putting the tally marks of where things came out when we talk through the rubric, you can begin to get a feel for where things are. And again, recording notes is a really helpful thing because it will inform your process in continuous improvement and help you when we get to the next section. So you can see that those are all reflected. And then the next area where we did staff development, and there isn't a note section for each, um, is it component? I lose the words. I get confused with the class, <laughs> um, but on each page. So you can bring in notes from both sections. So we can see here that we have, while we were more in the initial and in development and the prior area in staff development and certification, generally we're falling more in the well-established. But you can also see clearly you know, where things need to be addressed. And that will help you as you move forward. And Nicole, if you wanna scroll down and there's, you can see all of the areas here and identify your strengths and your opportunities for growth. And this really can translate well into an action plan. So when you have strengths that are there, that's great to inform the things that your programs are doing well, and then opportunities for growth. So there might be an opportunity in the example that we did to discuss with um, child development services, you know, revisit the MOU and look for opportunities for ways that that may become a more effective relationship, that the school department might be able to supplement their work. You know, there might be an opportunity for a contract. Um, things going forward where you can problem solve together. Um, in districts operating in collaborations, there, there are opportunities where that MOU may also be adjusted and you may shift the way you're doing things in your partnership. So these are great ways to get this information and contain it in one place. This isn't meant to, again, be used just to visit at the end of the year and say, oh, well, we were mostly in the in development or we were mostly well-established. It's meant to, even if you're well-established or if you're meeting those basic chapter 124 expectations, where do we grow? How do we continue to move our program forward? So. Those are some examples that, you know, Nicole has added in for our fictitious classroom. Mm -hmm. We can establish goals. I know that the district that test drove this for us is really planning on using this to drive their professional development for the following year. They're going to use that to choose um, an admin team in collaboration with the, the teachers to identify how they're going to move forward and I, I, they identified some professional development areas that the teachers would like to work on, namely working around working with and supporting multilingual learners. And there are some pieces that will go back and for the admin team to discuss in their agreements with their partners. Okay. Oh, we are, you know, that kind of takes us through the document and we'd like to open, oops, the feel the floor to questions from you folks. Okay. And while I do that, I'm just going to share my screen to show you where this will live. Oh, I'm sorry, that was my other part. Oh, I, good. <laughs> just unmuting to say I'm popping that in the chat right now. I'm going to throw yep. the link to where this document will live, and Nicole's going to show you where it's going to live. But I'll put the yes. link in the chat. So this will be on our early learning page, and you'll find a number of resources there. This will reside right above the guidebook so that both of those tools are there and the guidebook and other tools on the page have a lot of um, resources for you. So if you are finding an area that you're identifying an area of, of need for your program, I would always refer back to that guidebook for some tools and resources, as well as to the other pages um, and links within the early learning site.
Okay. And now we can open it up for questions, yeah, sorry. Thank you. comments, or general discussion. So when will the link be active? <clears throat> I believe it's active currently. Not active yet. So this is where it oh, lives. So sorry, it's going to be active at, by probably one o'clock. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that as we went through it, I didn't see any major snafus that needed to be edited. And I think that will be ready by then. I guess I, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, I, I really appreciate under each category, the opportunity to tally in different, different categories across the, you know, yes. however you were phrasing it, I apologize. Um, you know, because it makes me feel like I would be more able to look at my program in a really well-rounded way and celebrate the things that are working well, and then be able to, you know, as, as you know, the purpose of the tool is, you know, to self-evaluate, to see where we need to improve or what we need to be working on. So it feels like um, it's not a punitive thing, even though I'm choosing to do it for my program, nobody's making me do it. You know, right. sometimes these sort of tools can make you walk away and feel like, oh gosh, I'm really failing. Yeah, but no. um, I see this as as a tool that I wouldn't feel um, at all, you know, uncomfortable about using. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So. I'm glad to hear you say that, Pam, because that is exactly the intent. <laughs> and for many of you with new programs, please remember to give yourself grace. Yeah. You can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't have your program at optimal level in in the first year. It takes time to grow quality programs and right. Great. Yeah, so like we said, I just need some time to um, make final edits and tweaks, make sure everything's lined up correctly and looks good. Um, and then I, uh, it will be converted into a PDF format and linked in, at our site uh, right above the guidebook there. Um, I also will probably go into the guidebook and add it in there, but that's uh, above and beyond this particular conversation. Um, so it will be available. I'm not sure yet. I, I imagine we'll probably do a newsroom post to let the broader field know. Um, obviously, we let the field know of today's one hour sort of chat, um, but we will want to sort of celebrate that it exists <laughs> and reiterate um, its use and, and its benefits for, for programs across Maine. So. Um, I know our team is, is really excited to have this sort of checked off. Um, certainly, like you said, if you are using it and you see things that don't quite make sense um, or you have more feedback for us, please let us know to Marcy or myself, anybody on the early learning team. Um, our contacts are all back on the main page at the bottom. I yeah. just threw all of our emails in the chat as you were saying that I was writing it to put a chat. Okay. Great minds. Yes, great minds. Um, so we really appreciate though being able to sort of share this and, and celebrate that it exists um, and, and just offer any assistance that's needed. So thank you all for joining us um, and definitely reach out with any any questions or concerns and we'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.